Good morning. Good morning, folks. Bonjour. Apparently, I, uh, I see you're all feeling energized. Our final keynote is about to take stage. We would like to remind you that the closing ceremony will take place immediately afterwards, so we ask you to stay in your seats following the presentation. I would like now to introduce you to our um, speaker today. J'aimerais maintenant vous présenter notre conférencier aujourd'hui. Uh, it's Matt Ratto. Matt is a, a professor of information at the University of Toronto. He's also the director of the CIFIS, Semaphore Research Cluster on Inclusive Design, Mobile and Pervasive Computing. Uh, he also leads the Think Tank Lab, a non-profit lab space and research project examining and designing the Internet of Things. So welcome, Matt. Let's see here, so uh, make sure you can hear me back there, yeah? Uh, terrific, so um, let me start by, uh, with an apology in a sense. Uh, so I was looking over the abstract that I planned to, for the talk I planned to get today, and I realized that some things have changed in what I actually wanted to talk about. And um, one reason for that um, has been a change in my sense of the kinds of needs for IT services and IT work in the university. Um, and, in, and in a sense that we need to move beyond simply an innovation agenda to think also more, um, more specifically and more in more detail about what you might call the social implications of information. So in a sense, what I'm going to uh, talk about is, is not just that we need to engage our students uh, and faculty and staff uh, to become more um, active technology creators, but also more active technology thinkers in a sense. Now, the reason for that is uh, why I've been thinking that way is because of some things that, that have happened in my own life recently. Now, um, a few, well, last week, last Wednesday, as a matter of fact, I appeared on uh, the TVA, TVO current events show, The Agenda, um, uh, hosted by Steve Pakin and with a guy named Cody Wilson, a University of Texas law student. Some of you have probably heard of Cody. He uploaded onto the internet a few uh, months ago now a, a 3D file uh, that allows for the uh, printing on a 3D printer of a working handgun. Uh, so this is actually the working handgun that we printed in my lab. It's actually, I disabled it uh, before printing it, so it is not actually a working handgun. Um, but this really made me think in more detail about the fact that information isn't just relegated to the screens and to the kind of information systems that we're typically thinking of, of where, where that stuff is. More and more it's impacting our lives in very interesting ways and, and in very, in some cases, potentially troubling ways. And so really what I want to talk about here today um, is this need to, to think more in more detail about information. And, and one of the things that I want to highlight before I begin is I actually also think that a lot of the same skills that we think of as developing creativity and innovation within the information world, uh, those practices and skills somewhat are aligned with a critical perspective on technology as well. And so when I um, was printing this gun with my PhD and postdocs, I realized that the same type of skills that they were using to think about the legal, and the social, and the economic aspects of 3D printing and, and new forms of information, uh, those same techniques and practices also could position them quite, uh, quite well to be entrepreneurs within these spaces as well. So I'm, I want to align a kind of a critical and an innovation agenda in my talk. And, and so to kind of shorthand my whole talk, I, I know that the, uh, the, uh, or, the organizers, uh, I think Daniela, uh, uh, someone said, uh, stay in your seats after this event. Um, I, uh, um, uh, so so I, I don't want to, to have you go running from the uh, auditorium after I say this. Um, but to, just to shorthand my talk, in case you just kind of want to turn off and you know, browse your email or something, uh, basically what I want to try and convince you all today is that we need to encourage not just making not just active participation of our students, faculty, and staff in terms of information systems, but what I call critical making. And so that's really my goal here today, and I want to walk you through some of those arguments. 
Now, I'm going to start by highlighting something that is probably important to know about me, which is uh, this is where my office and where my uh, work is situated. This is the Robards Library at the University of Toronto campus. I'm actually part of what used to be known as the library school. Now we call it the Faculty of Information. Um, and we have a broader mission nowadays to deal with information in, uh, beyond just the library, beyond just the archive or the museum, to address it in, in society in a broader sense. But there is a way in which this library origin positions us to think not just about information from a technical point of view, but also from a social point of view as well. So I wanted to show you my, I know it looks like a fortress. Um, it's actually a place of learning, believe it or not. Um, but when I first got to Toronto, when I first started thinking about making, thinking about encouraging and incorporating making into my practice, I was not able to create a lab on campus that did this work. In fact, I ended up creating it way off campus, about two kilometers off campus, in the basement of an old balloon factory, believe it or not. So nobody with a latex allergy could ever come to the lab. Um, and this was a project called Dimit. It later got known as Think Tank. Um, but we went off campus and we created this space. We included uh, uh, local companies as well as students and faculty and nonprofits in the work. We had a lot of physical computing and prototyping equipment there, 3D printers, computer controlled mills, laser cutters, a lot of that kind of stuff. And we had a classroom as well. And the kind of work we did, though, wasn't just about you know, creating new types of technologies. In fact, really, the work was about making things in order to understand technology in more detail. Some of the initial events that we did, um, I'll show you a few pictures from it, were things like this. This was a workshop uh, led by a local artist, a uh, curator named Nina Sesleggi, who um, wanted to explore uh, McLuhan's notion of the extension of man and thinking about the ways in which technologies and bodies relate to each other. So they actually built, in the workshop, thought about and built extensions of their own bodies using molding, so they would actually mold uh, using various craft materials, their hands, in fact. Um, and then they added to these, uh, to these molded fingers, you can kind of see them down here at the bottom of the screen, um, they added various electronic sensing technology. So the ability to sense temperature, to sense light. And they used that making experience as a way to think about how new technologies were impacting and changing the nature of the body. So this was a IT, but also somewhat of an artistic or philosophic examination of these kinds of themes. But now what was interesting about this as well is the people that were attracted to that included students, obviously, from the university, from a range of disciplines, faculty from a range of disciplines, but also community members and digital media SME participants as well. So the idea about this project and the kind of workshops we put in there was to create a kind of a third space where we could extend the kind of cognitive mission of the university and our understanding of IT out into the world in new ways. Um, now, that was actually worked. So, you know, I had it off campus in the balloon factory in this old discarded basement, and people at the University of Toronto started to like it. So in the end, I was able to move back onto campus, onto the seventh floor of this beautiful building, where I now direct the Semaphore Research Cluster and uh, my own lab within it, the Critical Making Lab. Um, and to give you a sense of that, um, these are the kind of projects we do there, which are somewhat odd <laughs> projects um, and somewhat um, uh, 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 diverse projects, but um, I don't even know if you can read this stuff up here, so I'll read it for you. Um, one project we've been working on is building a tennis ball for people who play blind tennis. These are visually impaired tennis players, um, so we've been working on that project for a while. Um, we also do critical gaming, where uh, uh, students and faculty come in and play video games and use those to think about digital media and gaming. Um, we also did a workshop recently where we built drag racing robots in order to explore questions of network um, management, and techno techniques and technologies for managing bandwidth. Um, and we do a lot of other things like that as well. This is, these are some pictures of the space. Um, uh, you can see some of the equipment that's uh, on the uh, top uh, right. That's a computer controlled PCB, basically makes circuit boards, it's Arduinos and uh, multi-testers and 3D printers and all that kind of stuff in the space. And really the question um, that, that has come back to me uh, over the years has been, what the heck does this kind of activity have to do with this kind of activity? What, how do you relate the kind of stuff that we're doing, the 
extension of the bot, hacking the bot. I mean, what the heck is that kind of stuff compared to the providing of information resources the, the, and equipment uh, to students and faculty so they can access information? And what I'm going to argue is that, in fact, this is about developing literacy. That, that, that's the need, and that's the work that we're trying to do. Now, to give you a little bit of a sense of this in more detail, I want to show you a short clip. See if the audio works here. Um, of one of our workshops, and then I'll describe it in some more detail. Um, here at Intent, we're running a workshop that's uh, looking at uh, how people, uh, the type of information people need, good uh, decisions about energy conservation, uh, workshop on geofeedback. And it's part of that work, we're actually having the uh, participants build these uh, little cardboard doll houses. We use the open source platform, or video platforms, basically creating kind of digitally enabled doll houses. So we 3D printed the little appliances, which have little lights inside of them, and they're in there basically assembling these and then using them as a physical simulation to run through various models and actions. Might someone I disagree on how long it should last? I'd like to have a written moderator who can stand over this business. Full moderation is important, um, but not the fact that I can't have a proper Right, so that was uh, an example of a critical making session that we did um, uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years now. And in it, you can see some of the dimensions of the, of the work that we're interested in. Uh, the, the participants included PhD students in mechanical industrial engineering and electrical and computer engineering as well, uh, local business people, um, uh, uh, masters and undergraduate students. Um, and, and the idea behind it was to basically use the building of technology not to uh, build a new device, uh, but to explore these kinds of dimensions of the delegation of control over our environment and literally our environment, our, our heating and cooling uh, through technology. And so that's the kind of work that we do. I call that work critical making. Um, it links into a whole set of trajectories constructionist education, if, if uh, people are familiar with those kinds of tropes, but all sorts of other things like cultural probes and epistemic things. And there's a whole bunch of that kind of theory behind it. But the main goal of it is this idea, not just to make things, but to use the process of making as a way of doing critical thinking. So it's critical thinking through making, not keeping those two things separate. And that's the main aspect and, and focus of my own research and my own practice as well. So why? So again, back to this question, why do we need to do critical making? What purpose does that serve? And, and really what I want to do in this next section of the talk is walk you through what I call a pyramid of critical literacy, borrowing heavily from Abe Maslow, um, uh, and demonstrate the fact that our literacy needs have changed, that we're actually in a new period now, and we have new types of literacy needs. So I'm going to kind of walk you through this pyramid and talk a little bit about what those needs are. Uh, now, my starting point for this is actually this book. Does anybody know this book? Anybody familiar with it? OK, great, interesting. Um, so this is a book from about 1955 by a guy named Rudolf Flesch. And it was called Why Johnny Can't Read. 
And the, the focus of the book was basically uh, this, uh, this issue that, that Flesh saw, not just in the lack of literacy, this is reading and writing literacy, uh, not just that, the lack of it in the United States at the time, but that the, the bad way in which it was taught. So Flesh was basically laying out a new way of teaching literacy that he wanted people to adopt. Now, I'm not actually interested in his way of teaching literacy or the arguing for the positive or negatives of either type, but what was interesting was this was a popular book. This became, this sold millions of copies. Lots of people were really, really interested and concerned with this issue having to do with literacy. And it raises the question, why? I mean, going beyond just simply, you have to be literate in order to find your way down a city street kind of a thing or get a job. Why are people so worried about literacy? Why is there such a focus on it? You, know, you can see this focus on literacy in this picture of a classroom from the time period, and there's just language everywhere, right? Well, the argument that Flesh made and other people have made as well is that there is a direct connection between literacy and democracy. That without a literate population, you do not have a functional democracy. That people need to not just be able to read and write, but also to be able to process and understand bias within their reading and writing in order to participate to vote, in order to elect good representatives. Uh, this con connection actually between uh, literacy and reading and writing and bias and media and all these things is, is really articulated well in this movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Jimmy Stewart. Um, it's a great example of the kind of problems of literacy and problems of bias in the media in uh, politics, and I think it highlights this need for, for literacy. Now, Barron here makes this great statement that I think still exists today, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, come back to this also at the end of the talk. It's, you know, one of the purposes of education is not just to create job skilling, it's also to make people be able to be good citizens. And Barron uh, uh, Henry here says, education makes the people easy to lead, but difficult to drive, easy to govern, but impossible to enslave. So the idea is that without a kind of critical literacy of reading and writing, you do not have a functional democracy. Libraries, in fact, were created, this is why I know this history, libraries were created in part because of this. And uh, the Library Company of Philadelphia, which was one of the first libraries founded in part by Benjamin Franklin, um, was specifically to facilitate a kind of democratic process. And Ben Franklin writes in his autobiography, I'm gonna skip the first part of it, but he ends up saying that libraries have basically contributed in some degree to the stand so generally made throughout the colonies in defense of their liberties. So the idea here is that without that literacy developed by the libraries, you don't, you don't have the, the war of independence, you don't have a political action happening at, this, at, the, at the level of the colonies picture of the library, just for those of you who like pictures of libraries. Um, but you know, after that time period, we came, we, we, there were new needs for new types of literacy. And really, this, the, the biggest sign of this happened in the 1930s with Nazism and the kind of propaganda within the media that was associated with Hitler. Um, and in particular, it's associated with people like, uh, by the way, this is a great poster. I, I just think this is so funny. I always think it reads, um, uh, Kinder, what's with your Fuhrer? Um, it, it actually doesn't. It, it actually reads Kinder, what do you know about the Fuhrer? But at any rate, you can see the, sorry, you can see the kind of manipulation of, uh, that is present in the visual image with these cherub-faced children um, uh, and, a, and a smiling Hitler uh, and these swastikas everywhere. Now, a better representation of the problems of media and the issues of propaganda can be seen in the films of Leni Riefenstahl, who was the Nazi propagandist who made all these films, also of the uh, Berlin Olympics. And, and here you can begin to see that the kind of literacies that are required for unpacking media are slightly different than the kinds of literacies that are needed for unpacking text. There's the shot, there's the use of the visual image, there's a grammar associated with film that needs to be unpacked. Closer to home, you have things like Orson, happening in the same time period, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds radio broadcast that caused incredible chaos across the, uh, the Midwest, in particular the United States. Um, and there's a sense, you know, and McLuhan is, I think, a great indicator of this, a sense that there's a need to deal with media. Now, I always have to reference McLuhan in any talk I give. It's part of my University of Toronto contract. Uh, but, uh, I, but it actually makes sense in this context, um, where he says, you know, the famous quote, the medium is the message. And here the idea is that the technologies, the mediums that are used to depict and represent information have to be thought about and addressed in order to 
you know, I think we can project out, create a good democracy. So that's stage two critical literacy, this media literacy. And I think you can see where I'm going uh, to get to the world of information, which is next. Um, now, a number of scholars have noted this issue of, of, uh, of media counter and share in particular that we live in this multimedia age where the majority of information comes less often from print and more from all these various other types of sources. Um, and then this idea, again, I just keep hammering it in, don't I? Um, this idea that you, know, you need the development of critical media literacy to empower students and citizens to adequately read media messages and produce media themselves in order to be active participants in a democratic society. You know, okay, media literacy, also necessary, building upon textual literacy that preceded it. But what about now, right? Like, what about the digital world we live in now, this complex, mediated terrain of services and technologies that we use in our daily lives, almost in a kind of a constant and ongoing and interwoven way? I think this is a great picture of how I often feel about my digital information as well. Now, there's something here that we have to think about. You know, just as the media literacy was a different type of literacy than the textual literacy that preceded it, I th believe, and other people like Lawrence Lessig, believe that there's another issue with code, that there's something different about code that requires some new types of literacy. And Lessig writes, and this is back in the 90s, that code book that I just uh, showed you, that code, like architecture in real space, sets the terms upon which I enter or exist in cyberspace. It, like architecture, is not optional. I don't choose whether to obey the structures. Hackers might choose, but hackers are special. For the rest of us, life in cyberspace is subject to the code, just as life in real space is subject to the architectures of real space. So here what he's saying, basically, is that code affects our political life differently than the way media and text affected our political life. Um, and it does so in two particular ways. One is that software code often occurs, the effects of it occurs below the level of our attention. The, the effects are built into the information infrastructure itself. They're not really apparent to us. Um, and that's something that we need to think about. And the other thing is that code, unlike media and text, affects use and access not through interpretation, not through how we think about what we see and how, how, how what we see affects how we think about the world um, in the ways of language and textuality, but by actually controlling user behavior and access. So code is different than media, media just as media is different than text, and that requires, I think, a new kind of literacy as well, a kind of a code literacy that, like the literacies before, involve the require, require, I should say, both production and consumption in order to develop that kind of literacy. Now, libraries, the American Library Association has noted this um, uh, in regards to literacy and skilling uh, in, this, uh, in these three kind of uh, categories. And I'm going to ignore the first two, which I think are qu quite familiar to us. Basically, the need to make access available to all, the need development of basic technical skills, to highlight this last one, which is, I think, the one that is deserving of our attention, which is the recognition of the need for the development of higher level cognitive skills related to these technologies. Now, what I think this means is critical literacy in regards to these technologies. And, and this is our starting point, I think, this, uh, this paper um, uh, that I'm going to provide some quotes from now. And by the way, this is it. I won't provide any more quotes. Okay, I'm moving on to just beautiful images. Um, and uh, so Shapiro writes, what sort of information literacy, an often used but dangerously ambiguous concept, should we be promoting? And what should it accomplish? Is it merely something that will reduce the number of tech support calls that we have to deal with? Or should it be something broader, something that enables individuals not only to use information and information technology, uh, but also to think critically about the entire information enterprise, something more akin to a liberal art, knowledge that is part of what it means to be a free person in the present historical context of the dawn of the information age. So this idea of a liberal art, a liberal art form of information literacy is the kind of critical li literacy that I think we need to, to think about in more detail. And I'll tell you why we need to think about it. Because as I showed with that gun earlier, it's no longer the case that the effects of code are relegated simply to cyberspace. Cyberspace isn't the cyberspace of Bill Gibson's Neuromancer. 
where you would enter into the machine and leave your meat body behind. Instead, this is the world we're increasingly living in. This is a scene, a shot from Minority Report. Uh, have, have you guys seen this movie, by the way? So, some of you have seen it. So in this movie, what you see here is Tom Cruise walking through a mall, and he's being inundated by information, inundated by advertisements that are targeted specifically at him. He is inhabiting cyberspace. He's not going to it. And I think that's the world that we live in now, where cyberspace and real space are really blurred together. Now, what that means, really, is that code affects us in all aspects of our lives, not just when we go online, but in everything that we do. Uh, and in case you think that that's a future vision, that Minority Report vision, got to always remember Bill Gibson's favorite st statement, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed, and think about examples where the digital and the physical are woven together, often in ways that go beyond our understanding of it, that we don't even realize. So Zipcar, how many people have used Zipcar? Oof, they're not doing so well in Ottawa. Um, uh, Zipcar uh, is a technology that is predicated on a hybrid digital physical experience. The cars are wired up. The cars are internet of things objects. They are online, so to speak. Um, and the ways in which we engage with those are mediated by code. Uh, the smart grid, or the smarter grid, um, is another example where code is entering into our physical lives in unexpected ways. Technologies like Nest, where, which is a, a Wi-Fi smart thermostat, which is online, tracking information about our, our uh, temperature and providing services to us in both good and potentially negative ways. And then, of course, uh, Nike iPad stuff where the body gets wired up into the networks as well. And then finally, the 3D printed gun as yet another example where the physical world is getting interpenetrated with this digital life uh, and with this digital code that I think requires some kind of additional literacy. Now, um, probably not many Richard Brodigan fans out there in the audience, but this is a poem from the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and I'll just read a little bit of it because I think it, it captures the spirit of this new digital physical hybridity. And he writes, I like to think, and the sooner the better, of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony like pure water touching clear sky. I'll jump to the end. I like to think it has to be of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and joined back to nature return to our mammal brothers and sisters and all watched over by machines of loving grace. Now, I don't know if he meant it to be as creepy as it feels, <laughs> but I don't know about you, it sounds pretty creepy to me. Past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I mean, you start thinking of the, the beach ball in the winter or something like that. It's very predictive, it's very predictive. And this, in fact, all watched over by machines of loving grace, that is the world we inhabit. That's the world we live in now. And so this idea of developing literacy around this, this kind of dealing with text and media and code is, I think, of paramount importance. So let me finish my diatribe part of it, and then I'll show you some examples. Um, so this is what I want to say. An important goal of higher education, I think, is to create and sustain the inclusive literate populations necessary for good citizenship and democratic go governance. So it's not just about training workers. It's actually about creating citizens. To maintain this, there is an enhanced need to address the politics of technology, in particular code, for the reasons I just mentioned. But it's interesting, because I think there's a recognition of this more and more. People know that this is an issue. People realize that there is this need. And the greatest example of this kind of anxiety about the mediation, the unknown mediation of our lives through technology, comes, I think, uh, from the maker movement. So the maker movement, are people familiar with the maker movement? How could you, yeah, so many of you are. This is the movement where people really want to kind of create their own technologies, they're sharing source code, they're building physical computing devices, they're doing all this kind of stuff, robots and all the rest of it. Um, it gets highlighted in Wired Magazine. The DIY revolution is what it often gets called, how to make stuff. There are things like the maker's bill of rights that say cases should be easy to open, things like this. And projects, um, and very important projects like this one, which was the toaster project, where a UK artist attempted to build a toaster from scratch. And by that, by scratch, I mean he was uh, you know, trying to distill his own copper and uh, create his own enclosures and things like that, so it's entirely from scratch. Now, 
Again, the maker movement gets called a lot of things, but what I really think it is, is a deep, it, it comes out of a deep sense of anxiety regarding the technological mediation of our lives and a desire to better understand that. Um, this is kind of highlighted in this quote uh, that the Toaster Project originated from. Doug Adams, writer of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, writes um, in a different book of his, left his own devices, he couldn't build a toaster, he could just about make a sandwich and that was it. <laughs> now what's interesting about that, can any of you build a toaster? It turns out, it's actually really, really hard to build a toaster, and in a sense, that's what this, uh, this kind of thing depicts, particularly if you try to do it from the ground up, you know, uh, you know, without any types of equipment. We have to build your tools first, so forth and so on. So there's this deep sense of anxiety regarding technological mediation. The maker movement is a response to that, and I think the growth of that movement, these are just hack labs and maker spaces across the world from 2010, so there's lots, lots more since then is an example that people are increasingly interested in engaging with technology um, from this kind of perspective. So that being said, if the maker movement is kind of already starting to address these questions of literacy, these questions of technology, you know, what should, uh, what should universities, how should universities participate in this, I think is an important question. And I think one reason, in one way it can participate uh, is by dealing with the politics and dealing with the questions of diversity. So um, this is actually some, uh, some insights from Fikr Odun, who's a librarian uh, um, uh, in uh, a part of the Ontario Library Association. Um, and he notes that one of the problems with the maker movement is it tends to be apolitical. It tends to disengage from politics. So things like, for example, the maker movement or the people involved in it have not come out and made any explicit statements about 3D printing of guns. Uh, for example, and that there's a, the, the audience of it tends to be a, a non-diverse audience. It tends to include the usual suspects, white, middle class, male. So one thing I think that there are a couple of things that the university can do is it can incorporate a liberal arts understanding, it can incorporate an understanding of, diver, of the need for diversity in regards to this, and it can think about the politics because truthfully the maker movement um, is, is somewhat uh, torqued by various politics that are at work. Within it, these are uh, shots uh, that I took at the New York Maker Fair uh, last summer. And what you see in it uh, is definitely a notion of citizenship from the United States uh, arena, um, but also the uh, lots of military personnel walking the grounds, looking for projects to fund and support. And I'm not necessarily anti-military, but it is certainly something that needs to be considered. And I don't think you can be quiet or you know not address that. And that's something the university can also provide. And universities are starting to do that. They're starting to create their own maker spaces. This is from uh, University of Illinois, um, where they began uh, uh, their own space. And here they're building squishy circuits, which are basically using conductive Play-Doh to explore electricity. And what you see in this group also is a much more diverse group than you would typically see in the maker movement. Um, and and uh, looking at the various um, uh, people, you see people coming from a range of disciplines, students from a range of disciplines within the university as well. So that's kind of important. So let me end here with just a couple of examples of my own practice, which are even more weird and crazy than squishy circuits, the kind of critical making work that we do in my lab. Um, one of the first uh, projects that we do in a course that I teach called Critical Making is I have students build a moral technology. So I start them by having them read philosophy of technology. This is very scholastic. Technology, philosophy of technology on morality and technology. And I teach them how to build simple physical computing circuits. And then when they're, when they're good and dogmatic, when they've discussed the philosophy of technology and they're sure they know exactly how technology are or are not moral, I then say, now build me a moral technology. And they build things like this. This is one project, the Shame-O-Matic. Um, the the uh, reason for, the, for it came about um, because there was a, uh, an MP that fell asleep on screen. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, so they thought that this was an important technology, that, that it would be a moral thing to create a technology to stop that kind of process from happening. So they built this thing that basically, if you, it's got a tilt sensor in it, if you fall over one way or the other, it highlights the word bad. <laughs> So, which, by the way, is interesting because you can't actually see it yourself. 
It's not a technology for you. It's a technology for other people to, uh, to respond to, which is kind of interesting. And then they engaged with this in a critical, reflexive way. So it wasn't just about building it. It was also about thinking about it. And I won't go into much detail regarding that. But there was a way in which their reflection and their making were combined in this process that involved, it was in critical making. Um, other projects that I have them do is to build a PRM system or physical rights management system that mirrors the way digital rights management systems manage digital objects, but in the real world. And the idea here is to basically open up the ideas of DRM, not to simply say it's bad or it's good, but to explore what those things are and what, how they work. Um, Things that students build include this. This was a, a copy of, of Orwell's 1984, where you had to enter a code in order to access the book. If you got the code wrong, or after a set period of time, like five minutes, the, uh, the gate, would, uh, which was a servo, would come up and force the book closed again. So you, you had to re-enter your license every couple of minutes in order to use the book. Other students built much more destructive things, such as books that exploded if you took them out of the room, literally self-destructed. Uh, one group built a book that if you attempted to photocopy it, it popped a balloon filled with ink. So you could create a copy of it, but you could only have one copy at any given time. And you can see that these kinds of projects are basically attempting to mirror the way DRM systems manage digital objects, but in the physical world, as a way of reflecting and thinking about it. And another project that students built was the Good Measure, which was a digitally enabled measuring cup that made it where you had to download special recipes in order to use it. You couldn't use it without downloading the recipes. The recipes didn't include the units of measurement. Those were occluded from the user. Um, and that was also a way of reflecting on various aspects of uh, digital rights. And then we do things like much more kind of, those projects I just showed you are more within a classroom setting. These are much more, um, uh, workshop type of projects such as quantified self workshops where we explore embodiment and the quantified nature of uh, new technologies and build these various things at the same time and things like the DIY prosthetics workshop that I started this whole conversation with. So what you see in all of that really is a sense that there is there isn't an actual need for maker spaces within the university. There is a need I think to engage in this kind of critical liberal arts, might want to call it literacy as well. Um, but here are some ideas I'll end with for, for those of you who are interested in um, more pragmatic kinds of concerns. Um, I actually think it's a really important and interesting thing to build dedicated spaces for this kind of stuff within the university in the same way that we build computer labs. Spaces for exploring and critiquing technology, not just for engaging with us from a technical standpoint. Um, but I also think that the way to do that is to do that with faculty and staff of the university, not in isolation from them, but at the same time, not to necessarily buy entirely in to the goals of individual faculty or staff. So one of the problems I've seen with these kinds of spaces is they can get kind of uh, caught up in a pure engineering or a pure artistic practice. And really what you want is some kind of mediation between the two in order to develop that kind of critical literacy that I think is important. And then developing programming that fosters critical literacies means not only teaching introduction to Arduino or introduction to 3D printing or introduction to programming, but thinking more broadly about what to include. And then really what I'm trying to highlight here is that there is a history, there are sets of values and practices that are associated with the university and with higher education more generally. Um, and just because we're engaged in technical work doesn't mean that we shouldn't address and think about those values and, and systems. And, and that, in fact, it's very productive, I think, for us to do so. Um, so just to bang it home one more time, why Johnny can't read I think that was the problem of the 1950s. The problem now is that Johnny can't read an iPhone, that we can't read and understand the technologies that are mediating our daily lives, and that one of the things that we can do within, within our work within universities and higher education more generally is attempt to develop new types of literacies, new types of citizens to support this kind of broader social need. Because in the end, education is actually about citizenship. Thank you. And I should apologize.
apologize. I think it was the gun that really kicked this all off. <laughs> I, 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 and I, by the way, I would have brought it. Um, uh, and I could have easily brought it on the flight, Porter Air flight, would have been no problem to do so. It's completely undetectable. Put in my carry-on luggage and off I come. Uh, but I decided that that was asking for trouble. <laughs> Yeah. Shall I uh, do it or you? So my divide is uh, well, of course. Um, what changes do you see if any in the public school system to support this? Great point. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're you're, you're right in a way. In the same way that uh, if you have a non-literate person at the university, it's too late. I think there's certainly need for this kind of movement and this kind of work happening at the public uh, public school. You're talking about like lower, you know, uh, like high school, that kind of education. Yeah, um, I'll tell you one place where I'm seeing some movement in that regard, uh, not quite in the public school, but affiliated or close to it, is within science museums. Increasingly, science museums are interested not just in de depicting and representing scientific <laughs> understandings, but also in getting people thinking critically about it. So that's a site for it. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of uh, stuff that needs to happen with youth. And we've just kicked off a project in my, um, in my lab, specifically targeting, uh, actually, I should say, hopefully funded by a, a, a bigger company, targeting workshops that are aimed at developing this kind of literacy with school-aged children. I think it's definitely necessary. Right. Yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on how universities can play in the forthcoming collision between intellectual property rights and maker <laughs> rights. Right. Uh, given the fact that we foster an open environment for creativity and innovation, you know, I look at the Maker Fair in uh, San Francisco, which is a very big uh, issue that there is a massive collision. And I just wanted to hear what your thoughts on that. Uh, Anthropological, sociological issue. That's a great. I mean, I you know, it's it's, it's such an inter university is such an interesting place in regards to intellectual property because on one hand, a lot of modern universities are really interested in mining the expertise of their faculty and staff to create intellectual property objects like patents and copyright and stuff like that. So they're very tied to that intellectual property agenda. On the other hand, there's this total culture of kind of open exchange of knowledge. And so often those worlds are in somewhat in conflict. Um, uh, I'll tell you, I'll give you an anecdote of where this happened, exactly this kind of thing happened, where there was a project uh, developing critical literacy among um, uh, Native uh, uh, American uh, uh, students in Arizona, I believe, where a university there created this Arduino-based toolkit to explore within this um, uh, reservation, kind of do environmental sensing of various types of work. It was an open project, but in the end, the university ended up patenting the device that was created, which made it completely inaccessible to the population for whom it was intended. And that, that patenting process happened because the university forced it to happen, not because the people involved necessarily wanted it to happen. So there's absolutely a collision. The only thing I do is I, I tend, to, with every, almost everything I do, I immediately uh, creative, I do a Creative Commons license on everything. I mean, I think you have to shortchange it somehow. And sometimes that also means working under the attention level of, say, your innovations and partnerships office within the university. This isn't being filmed or anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. This is, this is an easy message for the folks to pick up and take on. Um, if we push it, are we perceived as being self-serving, or how do we support it without uh, it being seen to be us pushing our own agenda? Uh, you mean at the unit within the university by other entities within, within the university? university within society. That's an interesting point because I think what I've seen is I've seen this in the library context as well, library services context. Where there's there's two two groups within those contexts. Where there's one group that says, well, we just provide services to the university. We're a neutral service provider to the university. We don't have any content of our own. Right? Within the library context, that's one side. And then the other side is, no, we're librarians, and librarians have always been about social justice and accessibility, and, and we do have content to provide 
regarding accessibility and those kinds of issues. Um, so I don't know if within the ITS kind of world, if there's that divide as well, or if it's entirely a, um, typically a, uh, a service only, neutral service only context. You guys would probably have to tell me more about it. But my guess is that the kind of message about literacy and democracy that I've been trying to talk about here would be well received by at least certain entities within the university. In particular, I think it's actually one of the differentiators of the university from, you know, as, a, as an entity, as a, as a public service entity, whether or not it's a private or public university, to tell you the truth, doesn't matter, as opposed to the kind of idea of um, education as merely skilling. So the kind of, uh, you know, um, the race to the bottom that the, where the university is nothing more than a service provider. So I actually think by ITS saying, no, you know, we actually do have content to provide more than just services, more than just neutral services. I think it would resonate with entities that want to support the modern university. But that's 